When Frederick Banting and Charles Best made the life-saving discovery of insulin at the University of Toronto almost a century ago, diabetes was much less common than it is today. Now it is among the fastest growing chronic diseases in Canada, increasingly referred to as an epidemic. Joining us now on what's needed to confront it, on the line from our studio at Western University in London, Dr. Stuart Harris, Professor of Family Medicine at the Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University. And here in our studio, Dr. Bernard Zinman, Diabetes Research Scientist at Mount Sinai Hospital's Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute and a Professor of Medicine at the U of T. Dr. Seema Nagpal, Vice President, Science and Policy at Diabetes Canada. And Dr. Jason Fung, Medical Director at IDM, the Intensive Dietary Management Clinic and author of The Complete Guide to Fasting. And it's good to have you three here in our studio. Dr. Harris, nice to have you on the line from Western University. And why don't we just start there? We need some basic background, I think, just to get our conversation started this evening. So what is insulin and why does the body need it? So insulin is a, a, a critical hormone for the body that uh, helps facilitate metabolism of uh, glucose or sugar, which is a key ingredient, of course, in, in, in life. Uh, and it, it helps regulate uh, that we have the right amount of uh, glucose or sugar, which is the energy for the body for all cells and organs in the body. And in diabetes, it, uh, things get deranged. In type 1 diabetes, you lose the ability to uh, have insulin available because of an autoimmune or destruction of beta cells in the, in the pancreas. So the body basically has no insulin. And uh, obviously, we have to give uh, uh, insulin externally. And in type 2 diabetes, progressively there's less insulin made, but even the insulin that is available to the body is less and less effective in helping uh, regulate this whole energy balance uh, use, utilizing glucose or sugar. Seema Nagpal, let's just see if we can understand better the difference between type 1 and type 2. And type 1 you need shots, and type 2 you don't need shots. And who gets it more, which type more often? Help us out with some of that stuff. Right, well, type 1 diabetes um, re requires uh, administration of insulin. It accounts for about 5 to 10 percent of all uh, people with diabetes. So the majority of people living with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. And they can take insulin um, if that is what uh, their physician feels is the best uh, mode of treatment for them. But mm. there's also other, uh, other medications that uh, can be used to manage their blood glucose for type 2. And type 1, it's always by injection that you administer it? That's right. Type 2, not necessarily? or um, they can, There are pills that can be taken, um, as well as uh, injections of insulin and other uh, medications that are taken by injection as well. So type 1, more serious than type 2, presumably? Uh, not really, no? actually. Um, oh. The, the conse consequences, the complications of diabetes can be quite serious uh, for both types of diabetes. And, and diabetes is a, a disease that's well known, but uh, not known well. Uh, hmm. A lot of the complications uh, with diabetes, people don't really understand. Um, the strokes, uh, for example, 30% uh, of strokes are uh, in people with diabetes. 40% of heart attacks are accounted for by diabetes. 50% of um, uh, renal disease causing dialysis is in people with diabetes. So there is that connection. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernard Zinman, if, if, if you've got it, how does it affect your life over the long term? So um, you've got good background now on the difference between type 1 and type 2. <laughs> Uh, it's almost 100 years since the discovery of insulin in 1921, and we're going to have a, a major celebration in Toronto uh, when we reach the 100th anniversary in 2021. Uh, and the Canadian Diabetes Association, or Diabetes Canada, as it is called now, will be involved, and hopefully we'll have an international meeting here. Um, and so uh, if you develop type 1 diabetes, uh, your life expectancy was dramatically reduced. People died from type 1 diabetes at a very young age. Uh, it could be six months after developing it, it could be a year, or it could be immediately after developing This is 100 it. years ago, presumably. This is all, that's right. Okay. And so then we had the insulin era. You know, the discovery of insulin, Canada's first Nobel Prize, dramatically improved uh, the outlook for people with type 1 diabetes. But then we really found out in the 70s uh, that it is associated with severe long-term complications. And so uh, now we have better therapies, better insulins, better means of monitoring, and so there's a dramatic difference in life expectancy for people with type 1 diabetes. In actual fact, well-controlled type 1s live a perfectly long and normal life. Well-controlled. Well-controlled. Well, type 2, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's interesting, Seema says, you know, 
that's also very serious because that's the majority of people with diabetes. That's where the epidemic is. It's in type 2. It's the obesity epidemic that's driving type 2. And those individuals frequently can be controlled diet, exercise, medication, but many progress, so they require insulin in mm. order to be managed properly. And there's all kinds of new therapies. Now, I do remember reading uh, Michael Bliss's book on the discovery of insulin. And we everybody always talks about banting at best, but we should give a shout out to McLeod and Collop, Absolutely. who were also involved in the discovery Absolutely. of diabetes at U of T almost 100 years ago. And uh, obviously, as a result of what they discovered, life for diabetics is now much better. Is it still getting better today? if you've got diabetes? Uh, that's a very good question because the, the diabetes itself is an ancient disease as described by the ancient Egyptians, but it's worse now than it ever was. If you look at the numbers, you can see this huge epidemic of type two diabetes. So in fact, it was actually quite unusual for type two diabetes uh, back in antiquity, whereas it's very, very common today. If you look at the numbers uh, in the US and Canada, both type two diabetes and prediabetes, are growing sort of exponentially. So it's actually a much bigger problem than it ever was. So the news, unfortunately, is not good. And that's where we really need to come up with new solutions and innovative treatments and so on for it because it's <coughs> going to impact so much. So not only um, you know, needing to take medications, but heart attacks, strokes, cancer. Mm. I'm a kidney specialist. The dialysis population has been exploding, blindness, amputations, all of that are all due to these metabolic diseases that are actually worse now than they were 2,000 years ago. Let me follow up with Stuart Harris on this. We are hearing that among indigenous people, diabetes rates are going through the roof. Why is that? Yeah, that's, that's completely correct. And, and uh, you know, diabetes rates are three to five times higher in our indigenous populations. <coughs> they happen at much younger ages and more frequently in women, which is the opposite of what we see in the general population. Uh, and it clearly is a reflection of a, 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 ma a massive change in the last couple of generations in people's lifestyle, moving from a very traditional lifestyle that uh, featured high intense daily physical activity and a, and a, and a very uh, um, low carbohydrate, uh, low fat type of diet into one of a much more sedentary behavior a uh, major impact of, of uh, so socioeconomic uh, depravity uh, and, and a predisposition to developing diabetes at a very young age. And of course, as you, you scale back the age of what people uh, uh, are diagnosed with diabetes, you increase their risk for long-term diabetes complications. Uh, and we're seeing it in a devastating way that's impacting our, our indigenous populations Factor in on top of that, the, the barriers to access to appropriate health care, uh, education, uh, uh, and, um, and all the other socio-demographic issues and the impact on our First Nations and Indigenous populations in Canada has been devastating. Uh, and it didn't exist 40, 50 years ago. Hmm. Seema, are there other groups in our society that experience diabetes in a disproportionate way as well? There certainly are. Um, people with a South Asian background who look like me. Huh. Um, people who, have, um, who are black Canadians, people uh, who are Chinese Canadians, uh, have a genetic predisposition to developing diabetes. Do we know why? Um, well, there's a genetic component to it, um, but as well, people with a family history of mm. diabetes, um, the aging population um, is also at greater risk uh, for, for diabetes. So uh, there's a lot of things that people cannot do to reduce their own personal risk, but there's uh, certainly some things that people can do at an individual level to reduce their risk as well. So if you are in one of those target groups that you just listed, how do you have to change your lifestyle? Well, there's a few things. I think that first of all, you need to become aware of your risk. So talking to a healthcare professional about what your risks are and uh, and if you have diabetes, a lot of people live with diabetes and don't yet know it. Do you have it? Uh, no, no, I don't. You don't. <laughs> I've okay. been screened. Um, so there are things you can do to uh, reduce your individual risk through healthy eating, stopping smoking, having an active lifestyle. But <coughs> these individual risk factors are only part of the complex interplay of, of factors that uh, increase risk. The environment that we all live in and the context in which we live have a very large impact on the subsequent development of diabetes. Is there a connection, Bernard, between obesity and diabetes? Absolutely. Indeed, it's the obesity epidemic that's driving the diabetes epidemic. 
<clears throat> if we didn't have the obesity epidemic, we wouldn't have a diabetes epidemic. And this relates, of course, to type 2 diabetes. And, you know, I think as healthcare providers, we can do a lot to change people's behavior. But I think there's also a responsibility for government and society to introduce changes that will reduce the obesity epidemic and thus reduce in diabetes. I think this is going to come as a surprise to a lot of people. Staying healthy while busy. Let's bring this graphic up if we can. There was a study that followed 7,300 working Ontarians between the age of 35 and 74 for a dozen years. And here's what they found. Women working more than 45 hours per week were 63% more likely to develop diabetes than women working 35 to 45 hours. In other words, you work more and your chances of getting it are increased. There is, however, no statistically significant higher risk for men working longer hours. Okay, Seema, help us out with this. Why would there be this gender difference? Yeah, so to me, this really highlights the fact that context matters, that the conditions in which people live and how they work, their social environment, their built environment, and their food environment impacts how we, uh, how we experience uh, risk and how we go on to develop an illness and how we live with that illness as, uh, as we go on. So uh, in this case, uh, we, they determined that women were at a higher risk, but there's several studies that show that people living at a lower income at a, are at higher risk. Hmm. Uh, people, like we said, who are Indigenous Canadians are at higher risk. People who uh, have South Asian background are at higher risk. So there are certainly subpopulations within uh, the diabetes, broader population, that experience a higher risk. You need to be careful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's an association does not prove cause and effect. So association studies are interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, they guide us as to where we should do our next research right. program. But association doesn't prove cause and effect. There are many other variables that could be associated with women working those longer hours that could be contributing to diabetes, like weight, mm -hmm. uh, exercise, the kind of work they're doing. So you, you need to be very, very careful about drawing conclusions from studies that are just associations. Yeah, I think these are great for generating <clears throat> hypotheses, but exactly. The women who are working longer, maybe they have to work longer, so they're in a lower socioeconomic state. Maybe they can't exercise, so now their lifestyle is impacted. Maybe they have to eat fast food more often. So there's lots of different exactly. things, uh, and that's where it's interesting to deep dive deeper and further, but mm -hmm. it's really a hypothesis generating sort of a study. So women watching this should not go to their employers and say, you that's know right. what? <laughs> if I work less, I won't have exactly. diabetes. That exactly. is not yeah. correct. Okay. Can't quite go there. Well, um, <clears throat> all right, Stuart Harris, tell us about what kinds of projects are on the go right now that you think could make life better for diabetics today? Well, there, you know, it, it's interesting. We, we, we are living in an epidemic that is exploding. We're approaching in the next 10 to 20 years a half a billion people worldwide that are going to be uh, diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we're in a remarkable era of discovery for both uh, programs and technology and uh, treatment. So we are, have never been better equipped to help people with diabetes live a normal and healthy lifestyle. From the, the innovations in uh, new therapies that are remarkable, we now live in an era where we can help treat people with diabetes with therapies, with drugs, that actually also facilitate weight loss, which is, as has already been described uh, quite accurately, the driving uh, force behind much of the diabetes epidemic, uh, or diabetes, as some people like to call it. Um, so new therapies that are safer than ever, that mimic and uh, 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 facilitate the body's adaptation to be able to better manage their blood sugars. And we know that if you do that long term, that's how you prevent. I mean, we know how to prevent the diabetes-related complications. It's, science has taught us that over the last 10 to 20 years. Uh, it's a matter of putting it into play and overcoming what we see happening a lot in in the clinical setting, which is something called clinical inertia, where although we have the best guidelines developed in the world, and that's uh, one of uh, Diabetes Canada's greatest achievements, is we, have, we are recognized as having the best evidence-based clinical practice guidelines in the world. It's facilitating those translation into practice. But really, as Bernie uh, alluded to, we need, we need policies. We need a public health strategy that tackles obesity. And, you know, of course, the, the ideal uh, scenario is one that was done for smoking that, that targeted not just, you know, taxation 
uh, but uh, facilitated, you know, uh, disallowing smoking in public places, et cetera, targeted uh, advertising, et cetera, that really helped encourage people to want to quit smoking. We need sim a similar strategy around obesity. And unfortunately, here in Ontario, in Canada, we, we do not have anything close to resembling a public health approach and strategy to obesity prevention. But in an era of incredible new technological and pharmacological advances that are really exciting and give us a lot of hope. Uh, uh, and I think people with diabetes should have a lot of hope. Bernard, why don't you follow up on that? What would yeah, a diabetes so, strategy look like? So just to, to expand, for type 1 diabetes, we have new insulins. We have insulin pumps. And we are now close to a closed-loop system that could be clinically applicable, which is an amazing advance. What does that mean, a closed-loop system? <clears throat> a system that measures your glucose and delivers the insulin in an appropriate fashion based on what your glucose level is. Okay. So it actually, that's what your own healthy pancreas does. It produces insulin in response to what the glucose level is. I guess we should tell people, you know, who, who aren't as familiar with it, there are people who have to... Like prick, prick their, their fingers, fingers numerous four times. Four to six times a day. Four to six times a day. Now, with new advances, that does not have to be done. Hmm. There are continuous glucose monitoring systems that not only alleviate the need to prick your finger four or six times a day, but provide you with 24-hour glucose profiles. So if you're going low hmm. in the middle of the night, you can detect that. There are hmm. alarms that would wake you up. But all you have to do, these are devices that are now on the iPhone, you have, wear a, a patch the size of a toonie, and you just swipe that, and it gives you your, what your blood sugar is. So that's an amazing advance for patients with type 1 diabetes. They're able to achieve glucose control that's near normal, and the DCCT, the most cited uh, uh, study in uh, diabetes, demonstrated clearly that if you have type 1 and you keep your glucose as close to normal as possible, there are no long-term uh, bad consequences. You will live a normal, healthy life. Now, for type 2, it, it's a totally different thing. It's a matter of working on the obesity epidemic. Uh, and as Stuart mentioned, there are new therapies that not only lower your blood glucose, but reduce the common complications that we're worried about, namely cardiovascular disease. Mm. Well, I want to go to this guy. Renal disease as well. Let me check this out with Jason, because you, you have a bit of an unorthodox approach to at your clinic to dealing with type 2 diabetes. What do you do? Well, what we do is really focus on the obesity part of it, which we recognize drives the type 2 diabetes. So if really the problem is obesity, you got to treat that. So what we're bringing is not the newest technology. We're actually bringing literally the oldest dietary intervention <laughs> known to humanity, which is intermittent fasting. So it, really all it is is a period of time that you don't eat. And people always think it's really bad, but pe you know, literally every major religion in the world does it. As physicians, I prescribe it all the time. If somebody needs to do a colonoscopy, they need to go for surgery, they need to fast. If they do fasting blood work, they need to fast. We know that if you don't eat, your blood sugar will go down. So why can't we use that in a therapeutic manner? You don't eat, your blood sugar goes down, all of a sudden you don't need to take that drug anymore. You don't eat for how long? This is where we have to individualize it. So you can do, so normal fasting periods should be about 12 to 14 hours between dinner and breakfast. So you can push it to 16 or even 24 hours. You need to always uh, consult your doctor, make sure you're doing it safely, adjust your medications. Mm -hmm. But now you have an intervention which is 100% <clears throat> natural, which has been done for thousands of years, that can actually let your body simply use up the sugar. We all know if, if you don't eat, your blood sugar drops. Well, that's great. That's actually the perfect thing we want to do. And you're letting your body do all the work rather than using exogenous medications and so on. So exogenous? That's we, uh, outside the body, like drugs and Got so it. on. And, and, and that's where we've treated uh, thousands of patients. And we see diabetes reversal all the time. Almost every single day I walk in the door, there's somebody who's taking less medications, they're off their insulin. And again, we're simply attacking the root cause of the problem, which is the obesity. But if you are obese, obviously this isn't the case for everybody, but in a lot of people, it's because they eat too much. How motivated or how difficult is it to get patients to go 16 hours without eating? It's not easy, it's not fun. I'd rather eat donuts myself. But the point is that as a physician, my job is not to tell people what they can and can't do. My job is to tell them what they can do to make themselves better. Don't get me wrong, not everybody will do it, but those people that do it so, see a benefit. So Steve, let me jump in here. So the, the aim is 
to reduce nutrient intake, right? And, you know, many, many diets work. Uh, mm -hmm. The ideal diet would be to reduce portion size, mm -hmm. to eat three healthy meals a day. Uh, you think that's better than fasting? Well, it depends what you mean by better. Uh, people can adhere to simple rules. So in a low carbohydrate diet, that's a simple rule. I don't eat carbs and I lose weight. Well, because you're, if you don't eat carbs, you're gonna reduce your total caloric intake. Intermittent fasting, at the end you eat less calories for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Is it sustainable for a long period? What are the long-term outcomes of that kind of approach? That hasn't been studied yet. But things like Weight Watchers and other plans, they're very balanced, nutritionally sound interventions that try and focus on reducing portion size and caloric intake. A very difficult thing for people to do in our society because we're surrounded by these signals. We're surrounded by fast food that's cheap. And, and, and that's one of the biggest problems. So the smoking sort of strategy is a good idea, but stopping smoking, which we do by rules, like you can't smoke in your office, you can't smoke here, is much simpler than changing that common enjoyable, socially appropriate thing that we love to do is going to eat. Stuart Harris, what's your take on whether or not fasting will get it done? Yeah, so I mean, I think it, it, it's an interesting premise. Um, and there are many different dietary strategies that have been tested. Many of them, uh, most of them show that they work over a short period of time. The challenge is sustainability. Can people adhere to a lifestyle change that is quite radical from the way they have lived their lives or the way their family members and friends live. And, and that's been the big challenge. You can look at the world's literature on dietary interventions, and they all work short term for the most part. You can always find studies that'll demonstrate the benefit that's being sought. But the challenge is most of them <clears throat> fail when you look at one to three to five years. And I think getting back to what Bernie is saying, anything that will facilitate a reduction in energy intake, uh, cutting down the amount of calories you eat uh, during a day, if you can sustain that, uh, and he gave examples of project, uh, programs that have demonstrated that, such as Weight Watchers, then, it, then that is what you want to strive towards. And so I'm still waiting to see uh, if we can come up with the right kind of model that matches uh, the ability to reduce caloric intake by whatever strategy but can it be sustained over one to three to five years? And that's how we can start to make a dent in the, uh, in the obesity epidemic and thereby also the diabetes epidemic. I want to get Seema, you know what, hang on a second. I want to hear Seema on this and then we'll get you to, because um, not everybody's completely sold, it sounds like, on, on the approach you're taking. So Seema, what's your view? Well, two things I'd like to add to this. Um, one is that the best diet is a healthy eating pattern that a person can sustain. Mm -hmm. So uh, that might be different for me than it is for you, and it, there is certainly no one size <clears throat> fits all for a healthy eating pattern. But it sounds to me like you're saying fasting is not a long-term sustainable approach. Oh, it certainly is for some people, but it's certainly not for others. Okay. And there are other uh, healthy eating patterns that might be uh, better suited for different individuals, and those work for those individuals. So um, there's no magic diet here that works mm -hmm. for everybody in all circumstances. Um, the other thing that I want to do is, is just take the focus off the individual for a moment. Um, the food environment currently promotes right. um, unhealthy eating. We bombard our children with exactly. advertisements to eat <clears throat> nutrient poor, highly processed foods. Soda pop, fast food, exactly. junk food. Right. And, it's, and, and for uh, those of us in, in families where it's uh, both parents working, it's really hard to get healthy foods on the table every, every night. So uh, we live in an environment where we uh, encourage highly processed fast foods and uh, uh, and we need to change that. Um, relying on the individual to make uh, choices every single time, when we make it harder to eat healthy, mm. it's in an easier to eat unhealthy, that's where uh, we need to change. This, this food environment needs to change. Can I get you now to speak to this issue of how sustainable your approach is? Yeah, and, and what we're talking about, I actually think we're all on the same page here is we're providing options for people. That is an option that a lot of people haven't considered before, which is using fasting as a therapeutic dietary strategy. And it's simply a tool in your tool belt. You don't have to use it, you can if you want. I mean, we have patients in our, in our clinic who are five, six years and they've reversed their diabetes. They still maintain 
a certain amount of fasting. The, the, the point is that fasting, the word is sort of a dirty word, but the very word breakfast, it's the meal that breaks your fast. What it acknowledges is that fasting is a part of everyday life. That mm. is, there's a period that you should feed and there's a period that you should fast, and that's normal. Should be 12 to 14 hours, say, if you eat dinner at six and breakfast at eight. If you have too much sugar in your blood, for example, you can simply push that a couple of hours and it's okay. Mm. But that gives you an alternative to whatever you try, Weight Watchers, three mm. meals, like people have done that already. If they were successful, we wouldn't need to do this. Yeah. And we don't have to. Bernard, can I ask you whether... Let me just comment You want on, to come on back the, on yeah, that, yeah, okay. Because yeah, I think it's really, really important. So um, where the focus should be is on children. Because we know as an adult, your body thinks this is the normal weight. You're mm. overweight, but it'll do everything it can to sabotage weight loss. Mm. So when you try and lose weight, let's say you weigh 220 pounds and your friend is 160, and you get down to the same weight as your friend is, in order for you to maintain that 160, you have to eat about 500 calories less than your friend because your body has changed its metabolism. Hmm. And so that's very unfair. You look at all the work you've done, and yet you continue to have to do this. The data at five years, the ability to successfully lose weight and maintain that off is the same as surviving pancreatic cancer. It's about five to 10%. Hmm. This is not easy. The secret is to start early. School children, the, the education that we provide uh, to children about nutrition and exercise, that's the secret. Hmm. And because once you're an obese and child and you're an obese adult, it's gonna be extremely difficult to get effective therapies. Now we have some medication and we, and therapies and it. other. Go ahead, Stuart Go Harris, ahead. come on in. No, I was going to say we've seen a tripling in the pediatric obesity rates in the last 20 years. That's the problem. At the time when we take away physical activity as a mandatory uh, program in schools, uh, there uh, is getting more and more difficult for kids to access after-school programs around lifestyle, and they go home to a very unhealthy uh, dietary habit. You know, when we were doing uh, uh, studies uh, with our First Nations partners in Northern Ontario, what the community decided to do as an intervention strategy around obesity and diabetes was introduce healthy lunches for kids in the schools because the kids often didn't have access right. to healthy foods uh, or weren't sent with healthy lunches. And the community, the population recognized that, as Bernie alluded to, that you really got to facilitate and focus on how to help kids lead a healthier lifestyle. And if, and if we're looking ahead, you know, it's very depressing that we're having this conversation about the amount of diabetes we're seeing in obesity and how it's uh, increasing at such a dramatic rate. I mean, Bernie and I were having these conversations 15 to 20 years ago, and things are getting worse. So we, at some point, have to start changing this, this the pendulum and move it the other way. Uh, and I agree, I think starting to, we know those, those obese kids are gonna become obese adults. Uh, and anything and everything we can do, dietary strategies, public health policies, education, public school programs, and newer therapies that help facilitate weight loss, uh, these are all great strategies and we need all of them if we're really gonna make a dent in what we're looking forward to in the future. I, I absolutely agree. And look at what we're teaching our kids. Like I have uh, kids in school. You go to, you have your breakfast at home, you have a mid-morning snack, then you have lunch, then you have an after-school snack, mm -hmm. then you have your dinner, and if they play soccer in the middle of the half, parents thought it was important that they have some juice and cookies. And then they have a bedtime snack seven times a day. Hmm. So in the 70s, if you, if you wanted a bedtime snack, your mom would say, no, you should have ate more at dinner. <laughs> if you want an after school snack, you're gonna ruin your dinner. But we've, we've sort of institutionalized the fact that these kids, and who will grow up into obese adults, should eat, eat, eat all the Constantly. time. Yeah. And when is your body supposed to digest that food? When is that normal fasting period that they're having? They actually, mm. if you look at the dietary patterns in the 1970s, people ate three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, the most recent study where they gave people a smartphone app, the average time that people ate was almost 15 hours a day, average. So if you start at 8 a.m., you don't stop eating until 11 p.m. Hmm. When are you supposed to digest that food? All that sugar is going in. When is it supposed to be digested? Hmm. And the answer is that it's not. Seema, let me ask you about whether, uh, I mean, Bernie made the, um, excuse me, Bernard made the uh, comparison to cancer uh, a while ago. And you can get treated for cancer and you can be cancer free. 
Is it the same with diabetes? Right, well, for most people, diabetes is a lifelong condition. So once you've got it, you've got it. That's right, that's right. It can be controlled by diet um, and uh, can be controlled by medication, but once you've got it, you've got it. And that's why we want to do everything we can to make sure that uh, we can prevent it when it's possible. And then once a person develops diabetes, that they're uh, managing their condition uh, and being screened for complications to avoid longer term poor health outcomes. What percentage of people could have it and then actually conquer it? as in reverse it, it's gone. Yeah, I, I can't give you that statistic yeah. right now. It's really um, developing a so, <laughs> Yeah, so let me, I think yeah. that's great. And if you look at the diabetes epidemic, I think we can talk about three strategies. Mm -hmm. There's primary prevention, and that's what um, my friend Jason's interested in. He thinks uh, that intermittent fasting could be implemented in a way that would reduce that. So prevention of type two diabetes means focusing on obesity, high risk individuals, family history of diabetes, native Canadian, et cetera. We can identify people at high risk. And that would be the best thing. Preventing diabetes from happening is, the, is key. Then once you have diabetes, there is some data that you could have a remission if it's early in the course of diabetes mm. uh, with uh, lifestyle changes. Uh, we're testing insulin early to see if that could put you in remission just like you have cancer. Bariatric uh, surgery. Mm -hmm. and bariatric surgery, if you're obese, will put you into remission. So that's also possible. Then what we're dealing with now is the large number of people with type 2 diabetes who need treatment to prevent the complications. So once you have diabetes, it's not the end of the story. Mm -hmm. We have newer therapies, as Stuart has already referred to, that not only reduce your blood glucose, but in... Uh, totally separate mechanism, prevent the long-term mm. devastating complications. So it's, it's, it's an exciting time, but we gotta get these into yeah. practice. Let and me it, go back to Stuart on this though, with just a few minutes to go. And that is, you, you know that there are, there are some people who are watching us right now who will be saying, you know, this sounds a bit like ADHD, which gets in the view of some overdiagnosed all the time. And now the sort of, you know, f the disease of the month to overdiagnose is diabetes. Everybody's getting diabetes. There's an epidemic of diabetes out there. Is there, I mean, give it to us straight, Dr. Harris. Is there any possibility that you guys are overdoing this? <laughs> <laughs> That's an Wish interesting <laughs> analogy. Uh, so, uh, no. <laughs> answer. Uh, I, we, we, we the, the, the difference now, Steve, is that we, the, the advantage diabetes has over many other chronic diseases is we have simple tests that have been validated that can identify uh, diabetes, and that's a simple blood test. You don't even have to be fasting anymore. You can just go and get an, a hemoglobin A1C test, get a confirmation, and boom, you have right. diabetes. Um, the important thing is, though, that we now, and as Bernie alluded to, we have, it's an exciting time because we know how the disease works. We know how the complications arise and we know how to prevent them. And that's really dramatically what has changed in the last 10 to 20 years. We now can prevent diabetes-related complications. We have therapies that have been proven to prevent it. So if you want to live, if you have diabetes and you want to live a completely healthy and normal lifestyle, everything will help. Lifestyle, newer therapies, the technology. Uh, so it's, it's a good news story because Absolutely. you're being... You're being diagnosed with diabetes at a time where this is just a chronic disease that if is well managed, you will live a completely normal, healthy lifestyle. And that's one of the key messages, I think, for the audience is this is an exciting time. Even if you're unfortunately diagnosed, it will not impact your life. You just have to follow appropriate uh, uh, strategies, which includes, like for many people who are diagnosed with diabetes, it's a wake-up call. Oh, I have diabetes. I now I really have to start taking my whole lifestyle issues, my obesity issues, and we see that a lot. And that's a big focus of the diabetes education. That is lifelong. It's continually revisiting your opportunity to change the direction and stay healthy. So I don't think we're overdiagnosing it, but we're identifying people at a stage where before they develop the complications, which is when we used to still. Half, when we would often diagnose people almost too late, we now have the opportunity 
to help people live a completely normal life. Okay. Can I just pick up on something Please. that um, Stuart was made reference to a few minutes ago was that this is a public health issue. Right. It is a public health crisis yeah. that we need to deal with in a very comprehensive way. It's not a, it's not simply, a, there's no simple clinical answer to dealing with a diabetes mm -hmm. epidemic. So that's why Diabetes Canada has developed um, what we're calling Diabetes 360. It's a framework for dealing with the epidemic that focuses on four main pillars. Uh, the first pillar is around creating environments that are uh, supporting health. So we want to focus on a target that 90% of Canadians are living in an environment that promotes health. Uh, the second pillar is that 90% of Canadians are aware of their diabetes status, so that if you're at risk, you're aware of that. If you have diabetes, you're aware, it, aware of it, and if you're at risk for complications, you're aware of that. The third pillar is that people are acting based on knowing what their status is and they're engaging in interventions to deal with that. And then the final pillar is that 90% of those people engaged in those interventions are achieving better health outcomes because those, uh, those interventions are evidence-based to improve health. So in a comprehensive way, in a, from a public health perspective, there's so many things that we can do, um, at both at an individual level as well as at a system level to reduce the impact of diabetes. And it really is a whole of society approach. Well, I, I think on number two, awareness, I hope we've done something over the last half hour <laughs> right. to improve the public's awareness of what's going on. Yeah, so absolutely. I want to thank you all for coming in tonight and helping us out with this. And uh, let me wish you a happy 100th anniversary of the discovery of insulin two years in advance. <laughs> Maybe we should reconvene this group in two years and figure out how we're going to observe and celebrate that uh, important achievement. Thank Thanks so much, everybody. Great idea. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.